OA1 The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the show, Jill Robbins brings us Ask a Teacher. We also have a report from Dan Novak. And we close the show with an American story. We hear Hearts and Crosses by O. Henry. But first, the Mona Lisa is the famous Leonardo da Vinci painting of a woman with a mysterious smile. This week, the painting gave up a secret. Scientists used X-rays to examine the chemical structure of an extremely small part of the more than 500-year-old painting. The researchers discovered a technique Leonardo used in the work. A team in France and Britain discovered an oil paint used for the Mona Lisa was a special new chemical mixture. The research was published Wednesday in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. It suggests that the Italian artist may have been in an experimental mood when he set to work on the painting early in the 16th century. He was someone who loved to experiment, and each of his paintings is completely different technically, said Victor Gonzalez. He is the study's lead writer and a chemist at France's top research organization, the National Center for Scientific Research. Gonzalez has studied the chemical makeup of several works by Leonardo, Rembrandt, and other artists. In this case, it's interesting to see that, indeed, there is a specific technique for the ground layer of Mona Lisa, he said in an interview with the Associated Press. Specifically, the researchers found a rare compound, plumbonacrite, in Leonardo's first layer of paint. The discovery, Gonzalez said, confirmed that da Vinci most likely used lead oxide to thicken and help dry his paint. Carmen Bombach, a specialist in Italian art at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, called the research very exciting. Bombach, who was not involved in the study, said it shows Leonardo's spirit of passionate and constant experimentation as a painter, she wrote in an email. The speck of paint in the imaging study is about the thickness of a human hair. It lies in the top right area of the painting. The scientists looked into its atomic structure using X-rays in a synchrotron. The machine moves particles at close to the speed of light, permitting researchers to look deeper into the paint structure. Plubonocrite is really a fingerprint of his recipe, Gonzalez said. It's the first time we can actually chemically confirm it. Dutch artist Rembrandt may have used a similar mixture when he was painting in the 17th century. Gonzalez and other researchers have found plumbonacrite in his work, too. It tells us also that those recipes were passed on for centuries, 
Gonzales said. It was a very good recipe. Leonardo is thought to have melted lead oxide powder, which has an orange color, in linseed or walnut oil to make it thicker and dry faster. What you will obtain is an oil that has a very nice golden color, Gonzales said. It flows more like honey. But the Mona Lisa said by the Louvre to be a portrait of Lisa Garadini, the wife of a Florentine silk merchant, and additional works by Leonardo, still have other secrets to tell. There are plenty, plenty more things to discover, Gonzales said. What we are saying is just a little brick more in the knowledge. The largest Hindu religious site outside India in modern times opens to the public Monday in the American state of New Jersey. Its creators began planning the Bob's Swaminarayan Akshar Dam 12 years ago. Artisans and volunteers spent 4.7 million hours carving by hand the temple's two million cubic feet of rock. The rock material includes marble from Italy and limestone from Bulgaria. The material was sent to India for the carving work. Then the finished pieces arrived in New Jersey. Workers fitted them together in the city of Robbinsville to build the temple. The building stands on a 51-hectare property. The largest Hindu temple in the world is in Cambodia. The Angkor Wat was built in the 12th century during the Khmer Empire. It is now described as a Hindu-Buddhist temple and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Robbinsville Temple is one of many built by Bops, a worldwide religious and civic organization within the Swami Narayan sect of Hinduism. The organization has built two other akshardams, or houses of the divine. One is in the capital of New Delhi, and the other is in the Gujarat state, where Bops is based. The sect operates more than 1,200 temples and 3,850 centers around the world. It will celebrate its 50th year in North America next year. Bops faced criticism in recent years after workers launched a legal action against the group in 2021. The action accused Bops of carrying out policies including forced labor low wages, and bad working conditions. Twelve of the nineteen plaintiffs have now withdrawn their accusations, and the legal action is suspended while an investigation continues. The legal action claimed that Dalits, or members of the lowest caste in India, were being abused. Caste is an ancient system of social standing based on ancestry. Yogi Trivedi is an expert on Hinduism at Columbia University and a member of the religion. He said these accusations weighed heavily on community members because their religion has always taught them to see the divine in all. Caste and class do not divide us, Trivedi said. He said the temple would not have been possible without the service of thousands of volunteers. Many of them took time off school and work to serve in different areas. This might be the first Hindu temple where women were involved in building it, Trivedi added. 
This week, families from across the country have been going to the site to see it from the outside. Nikita Patel and her husband were among the volunteers who gave their time to create the temple. All religions, all communities are welcome here, she said, and here they will feel the peace. Trevetti holds a similar opinion. To him, the temple stands for universal values that can be found in writings and ideas of all religions. It's not even just Indian or Indian American, Trevetti said. What we've tried to do is express these universal values in a way that relate to all visitors. I'm Dan Novak. Our question for today on Ask a Teacher comes from a reader in China. Dear VOA team, I happened to find a question that I'm confused about. When I was surfing the web, I found historic and historical are both adjectives. Are there any differences between them? Can you explain how to use them? Thanks. Best regards, Albert, China. Dear Albert, This is an interesting question. The differences between these two words have grown over the years, not based on their grammatical form, but on how people have used them. So let's start by taking a look at what the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary says about the ways people use the words. The word historic is used for important and famous events in history. Here are two examples of that use. The weather reporter warned of a big storm coming that will be of historic proportions. Will you come to Washington, D.C. and be part of this historic event? In these two examples, we see historic used for a storm, and for a gathering. The word historic might also appear when people talk about sports. You can also see the word used to describe places. In the United States, we have an organization that has information on important places, for example, the home of a former president. Here is a statement using that phrase, historic places. That home is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And many local organizations fix up old buildings that are part of their town's history. This process is called historic preservation. In this neighborhood, homeowners care a lot about historic preservation. Moving on to the word historical, we find it used to describe history, as in the historical record. It appears more often than the word historic, and also appears with words like perspective, literature, and analysis. Here are some examples. Historical evidence suggests wolves are both man's best friend and his worst enemy. Isabel Allende wrote many works of historical fiction. To sum up, if the thing itself is important or famous, you would probably use historic with it. If the thing you are talking about relates to history, something real in the past, use the word historical. I hope this clarifies the use of these two words for you, Albert. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. Do you have a question for the teacher? Write to us at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins.
You just heard our program, Ask a Teacher. Now, Teacher Jill joins me in the studio. Hi, Jill. Hello. You talked about the words historic and historical in your report. Here are two words that sound similar, hysteric and hysterical. Tell us about them. Hysteric is a noun meaning an individual who acts or reacts unreasonably based on their emotional state. Hysterical is the adjective form. And then there is hysteria. That is often connected to communal situations, like weather hysteria. You know, when snow is coming and people buy out all the food stores in preparation? Mass hysteria! Yeah. Exactly. Thanks for coming in, Joe. My pleasure, Katie. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website learningenglish.voanews.com Arts and Crosses The two men prepared to separate. They took each other's hand. Bye, Baldy, said Webb. I'm glad I saw you and had this talk. With a sudden rush, the two riders were on their way. Then Baldy pulled his horse to a stop and shouted. Webb turned. If I were you, came Baldy's loud voice, I would be king. At eight the following morning, Bud Turner got off his horse at the Nopalita Ranch House. Bud was the cowboy who was taking the cattle to San Antonio. Mrs. Yeager was outside the house putting water on some flowers. In many ways, Santa was like her father, King McAllister. She was sure about everything. She was afraid of nothing. She was proud. But Santa looked like her mother. She had a strong body and a soft prettiness. Because she was a woman, her manners were womanly. But she liked to be queen as her father had liked to be king. Webb stood near her, giving orders to two or three cowboys. Good morning, said Bud. Where do you want the cattle to go? To barbers, as usual? The queen always answered such a question. All the business, buying, selling, and banking, had been held in her hands. Care of the cattle was given to her husband. When King McAllister was alive, Santa was his secretary and his helper. She had continued her work, and her work had been successful. But before she could answer, the queen's husband spoke. You drive those cattle to Zimmerman's and Nesbitt's. I spoke to Zimmerman about it. Bud turned, ready to go. Wait, called Santa quickly. She looked at her husband with surprise in her gray eyes. What do you mean, Webb? She asked. I never deal with Zimmerman and Nesbitt. Barbara has bought all the cattle from this ranch for five years. I'm not going to change. She said to Bud Turner, Take those cattle to Barbara. Bud did not look at either of them. He stood there waiting. I want those cattle to go to Zimmerman and Nesbitt, said Webb. There was a cold light in his blue eyes. It's time to start, said Santa to Bud. Tell Barbara we'll have more cattle ready in about a month. Bud allowed his eyes to turn and meet Webb's. You take those cattle, said Webb, to... Bob, said Santa quickly. Let's say no more about it. What are you waiting for, Bud? Nothing, said Bud. But he did not hurry to move away, for man is man's friend. And he did not like what had happened. You heard what she said, cried Webb. We do what she commands. He took off his hat and made a wide movement with it, touching the floor. Webb, said Santa, what's wrong with you today? 
I'm acting like the queen's fool, said Webb. What can you expect? Let me tell you, I was a man before I married a cattle queen. What am I now? Something for the cowboys to laugh at. But I'm going to be a man again. Santa looked at him. Be reasonable, Webb, she said quietly. There's nothing wrong. You take care of the cattle, I take care of the business. You understand the cattle. I understand the business better than you do. I learned it from my father. I don't like kings and queens, said Webb, unless I'm one of them myself. All right, it's your ranch. Barbara gets the cattle. Webb's horse was tied near the house. He walked into the house and brought out the supplies he took on long rides. These he began to tie on his horse. Santa followed him. Her face had lost some of its color. Webb got on his horse. There was no expression on his face except a strange light burning in his eyes. There's some cattle at the Hondo Waterhole, he said. They ought to be moved. Wild animals have killed three of them. I did not remember to tell Sims to do it. You tell him. Santa put a hand on the horse and looked her husband in the eye. Are you going to leave me, Webb? She asked quietly. I'm going to be a man again, he answered. I wish you success, she said with a sudden coldness. She turned and walked into the house. Webb Yeager went to the southeast as straight as he could ride. And when he came to the place where the sky and the earth seemed to meet, he was gone. One day, a man named Bartholomew, not an important man, stopped at the Nopalito Ranch House. It was noon, and he was hungry. He sat down at the dinner table. While he was eating, he talked. Mrs. Yeager, he said, I saw a man on the Seco Ranch with your name, Webb Yeager. He was foreman there. He was a tall, yellow-haired man. Not a talker. Someone of your family? A husband, said Santa. That is fine for the Seiko Ranch. Mr. Yeager is the best foreman in the West. Everything at the Nopalito Ranch had been going well. For several years, they had been working at the Nopalito with a different kind of cattle. These cattle had been brought from England and they were better than the usual Texas cattle. They had been successful at the Nopalito Ranch, and men on the other ranches were interested in them. As a result, one day a cowboy arrived at the Nopalito Ranch and gave the queen this letter. Mrs. Yeager, the Nopalito Ranch. I've been told by the owners of the Seiko Ranch to buy 100 of your English cattle. If you can sell these to the Seiko... Send them to us and care of the man who brings this letter. We will then send you the money. Webb Yeager, Foreman, Seiko Ranch. Business is business to a queen as it is to others. That night, the 100 cattle were moved near the ranch house, ready for an early start the next morning. When the night came and the house was quiet, did Santa Yeager cry alone? Did she hold that letter near to her heart? Did she speak the name that she had been too proud to speak for many weeks? Or did she place the letter with other business letters in her office? I ask if you will, but there is no answer. What a queen does is something we cannot always know. But this you shall be told. In the middle of the night, Santa went quietly out of the ranch house. She was dressed in something dark. She stopped for a moment under a tree. There was moonlight, and a bird was singing. There was a smell of flowers. Santa turned her face toward the southeast and threw three kisses in that direction. But there was no one to see her. Then she hurried quietly to a small building. What she did there we can only guess. But there was the red light of a fire, and... Noise as if Cupid might be making his arrows. Later she came out with some strange iron tool in one hand. 
In the other hand, she carried something that held a small fire. She hurried in the moonlight to the place where the English cattle had been gathered. Most of the English cattle were a dark red, but among those one hundred, there was one as white as milk. And now Santa caught that white animal as cowboys catch cattle. She tried once and failed. Then she tried again, and the animal fell heavily. Santa ran to it, but the animal jumped up. Again she tried, and this time she was successful. The animal fell to earth again. Before it could rise, Santa had tied its feet together. Then she ran to the fire she had carried here. From it she took that strange iron tool. It was white hot. There was a loud cry from the animal as the white-hot iron burned its skin. But no one seemed to hear. All the ranch were quiet. And in the deep night quiet, Santa ran back to the ranch house and there fell onto a bed. She let the tears from her eyes, as if queens had hearts like the hearts of ranchmen's wives, and as if a queen's husband might become a king if he would ride back again. In the morning, the young man who had brought the letter started toward the Seiko Ranch. He had cowboys with him to help him with the English cattle. It was ninety miles, six days' journey. The animals arrived at Seiko Ranch one evening as the daylight was ending. They were received and counted by the foreman of the ranch. The next morning at eight, a horseman came riding to the Nopalito Ranch House. He got down painfully from the horse and walked to the house. His horse took a great breath and let his head hang and closed his eyes. But did not feel sorry for Belshazzar the horse. Today, he lives happily at Nopalito, where he is given the best care and the best food. No other horse there has ever carried a man for such a ride. The horseman entered the house. Two arms fell around his neck, and someone cried out in the voice of a woman and queen together, Webb! Oh, Webb! I was wrong, said Webb Yeager. I was a... and he named a small animal with a bad smell, an animal no one likes. Quiet, said Santa. Did you see it? I saw it, said Webb. What were they speaking of? Perhaps you can guess if you have read the story carefully. Be the cattle queen, said Webb. Forget what I did if you can. I was wrong as... Quiet, said Santa again, putting her fingers upon his mouth. There's no queen here. Do you know who I am? I am Santa Yeager, first lady of the bedroom. <laughs> Come here. She led him into a room. There stood a low baby's bed, and in the bed was a baby, a beautiful laughing baby, talking in words that no one could understand. There is no queen on this ranch, said Santa again. Look at the king. He has eyes like yours, Webb. Get down on your knees and look at the king. There was a sound of steps outside, and Bud Turner was there at the door. He was asking the same question he had asked almost a year ago. Good morning. Shall I drive those cattle to Barber's or... He saw Webb and stopped with his mouth open. Bop, 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 cried the king, waving his arms. You hear what he says, bud, said Webb Yeager. We do what the king commands. And that is all, except for one thing. When old man Quinn, owner of the Seiko Ranch, went to look at his new English cattle, he asked his new foreman, What's the Nopalito Ranch's mark? X over Y, said Wilson. I thought so, said Quinn. But look at that white animal there. She has another mark, a heart with a cross inside. Whose mark is that? That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedell.